All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Leanne Wilson, Mantec's Director of Marketing and Business Development. Um, today, we are covering our Manufacturing Matters series presentation on maintenance excellence supports process excellence. The whole series in general is meant to give you the insights needed into different areas that Mantec has services in, including sales and marketing, um, process improvement, which is today's manufacturing technology and workforce engagement. Um, today we have Larry Bouvier from Houston and Neil. <laughs> um, he's going to explain his, his um, bio when he starts here. We do have the Q&A for in the chat area and we are recording today's session. So with that, I will turn it over to Larry. Well, good morning. It's good to, uh, to talk with all of you here today and to see you. Um, again, I'm Larry Bouvier from Fuss and O'Neill Manufacturing Solutions. Um, we're a little consulting house out of uh, New England, and uh, we work with uh, manufacturers to help uh, achieve excellence in productivity, uh, notably safety, quality, delivery, and cost. And a little bit on my background, I came out of the, um, the uh, metal casting and steel, mostly metal casting and steel industries, about 10 years ago, where I had uh, a variety of roles in, in maintenance and engineering. And uh, in the last uh, nine years, 10 years, I've been with Fuss and O'Neill and working with many clients uh, across the country to try and help them to remove equipment as an obstacle to productivity. So a little bit of a background. We, we talk about things that prevent process excellence. And uh, there's a number of things that happen out there that, that kind of knock us off of our, uh, our cadence. Um, one being injuries and hazards. Uh, scrap and rework, of course, is another one. And uh, the amount of costs incurred due to inefficiencies that take resources away from improvement programs and processes and poor delivery performance. Poor delivery performance eats up the time we have available to, to deliver uh, that, that uh, process excellence. So I try to figure out, you know, try to make a connection as to what is one of the missing pieces on this that, that stops us from achieving this. Um, now this kind of goes back into my own experience where I've worked with uh, a lot of companies who had some sort of a continuous improvement initiative. Oh, sorry, I seem to have bopped out of there. And what they have is, is that they're, they're dealing with, they're trying to establish a good continuous improvement program. And they, uh, they adopt processes like value stream mapping, and they, they develop manufacturing cells and Kanban. Uh, they apply 5S and, and, and visual management tools, um, do things like setup reduction, of course, and pokey oak or mistake proofing. Uh, perform Kaizen's and uh, hope to achieve lean manufacturing. And it always seemed to me like there was one missing piece. I would hear from a client saying that, you know, we've got this really, really excellent process, but it seems like the equipment is just not cooperating. Therefore, uh, it made me ask, um, what would be the effect of a consistent uh, consistently operating, well operating uh, suite of production equipment. I think that's what we, we need to make sure that we have in place in order to support process excellence. So let's talk about safety as an example. This is a great picture I got years ago on a line where there was a brass manufacturer. And what this is, is this is a major, uh, major safety issue about to happen. Okay, so, um, I'm just thinking of what would happen if this transformer uh, exploded. Um, I have breakdowns that are unexpected, causing non-standard conditions. Uh, non-standard conditions therefore uh, cause a, a deviation from um, being able to run at a normal, a normal procedure. Operator doesn't know how to respond. The process is thus disrupted. Not to mention, all of our attention is now focused on uh, where am I going to get hurt next? How do I deal with this injury? How do I keep this from happening again? So could there have been some sort of a maintenance effect, maintenance process that could have dealt with this? Well, of course. Another good uh, disruptor 
uh, I would say is quality. So where does, where does maintenance excellence tie into this? Okay, so I have an improper um, machine performance that causes scraps similar to what we're looking at here. So we have to adopt some sort of a countermeasure to maintain quality. And those countermeasures, well, they're not showing up on the, you know, the standard work procedures. And since I have a lack of those procedures, I, as the operator, is concerned, I'm not trained for the circumstance, and I'm unaware of, as to how to keep making good product. And I get a lot of scrap and rework. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to respond to a machine um, that's not making a good product, and I have to color outside of the lines if you say so. Doesn't it stand to reason that a good maintenance program may prevent this from happening? And what about cost? cost. We think about things like um, where do these excessive costs come from? Uh, well, if we have to do a lot of repairs on a piece of equipment, it's going to consume a budget, it's going to drive up our operating costs, and some of the things that are going to happen will be uh, items like uh, excessive overtime to perform this repair, unscheduled downtime, unscheduled staffing over the weekend. So I've got less money, I've got less of my body of resources uh, to develop, to devote in order to improve the process. And instead, what I'm spending my money on is to just restore the process back to where it should be. Uh, some of the other effects, we've already spent the money, so we can't do an upgrade. Um, we can't do good equipment care, et cetera, et cetera. And it just spirals out of control. So one of the things that we ask people to consider uh, in terms of process excellence is, is what does a minute of downtime cost? And you know, what, what is that impact? Think about delivery too. Delivery, we, we have a, an unscheduled failure of a piece of equipment. So now I have a longer lead time to produce hours. I have more overtime incurred to meet the demand. I have less time available to perform good maintenance, like preventative and predictive maintenance. And since I can't do that and we're devoting all our time to getting the order out the door, now the equipment performance continues to decline, causing more situations that we have to react to. So really, when I think about it, I look at maintenance, uh, you know, maintenance excellence, supporting process excellence, and that it, it helps uh, prevent erosion in the areas of safety, quality, deliver, and delivery, and cost. So what I really need to do, I really need to, to uh, create a consistent process, consistent uh, available uptime for my equipment in order to support that process excellence. And there's a number of things that we use, and I've, I, I could go all around the world with a million different procedures, but there's a few of them that really stick out to me that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And the first one that comes up that I think about is adopting a strategy of proactive as versus reactive maintenance. So I'm going to try to anticipate problems in advance, and I'm going to try to care for my equipment so as to keep those from ever occurring. What am I talking about? Let's figure out what the failures are that could be happening, that are naturally going to happen uh, in our environment, in our circumstance, in our equipment, and let's come up with a countermeasure for that that we can apply even before they exist. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to use standard procedures uh, in order to make sure that that care is consistently executed so we get away from breakdowns. Okay, so in, in our typical environment, suppose I'm, I'm Joe maintenance person and I have a lot of failures on a motor and I'm continually replacing it. One, one uh, process of proactive maintenance I might use is predictive maintenance. That's the only thing I hate about maintenance. There's so many darn P's in here. Predictive maintenance might have been able to forecast that the starter um, was where my uh, process originated. So I might use a predictive technology like uh, infrared thermography to identify that I was overheating and I could catch this in advance and take care of it before the process was disrupted. And that predictive maintenance is a very, very important, a very, very important part of this. And the reason why is this is because it allows me to inspect equipment as I'm operating and to find the problem before I go to complete failure as signified by this little red diamond down at the bottom of the screen. So suppose I'm doing that infrared inspection. I go out every six months and I'm checking to make sure that that one contact isn't getting hot. At some point in between the last inspection and the next one, something happens, loosens up, develops a little corrosion, starts getting hotter. 
well, the next time that I go out and do an inspection, I'm going to detect that deterioration. And what it allows me to do uh, via scheduled downtime is to plan that repair, to schedule it, and to execute it before I ever get to the point where I no longer can function. So that's one. That's one thing I can do. And that could be anywhere in a range of hours to months. Another interesting and useful technology that uh, we need to spend more time with is equipment center lining. What is the sweet spot in which our processes run and how can I set up my equipment and maintain my equipment to run within those parameters? So at what pressure, at what speed, at what temperature, at what flow is the best operating parameter? This can also uh, apply to physical locations. It seems to me that when I spend time with a, uh, a client that is trying to uh, achieve a little more consistent operation, I see a lot of tweaking. Do you see that too? I see a lot of people saying, "I will just do a little adjustment here. And we never really know what the best operating parameter is. So it, it depends on settings and not adjustments. The next tenet of that is, is let's just fix those adjustments in place that can remain constant through the whole run. In other words, we don't want it. We want to get rid of any ability to adjust on the things that can stay the same all the time. Following that, I want to put something visual in place that can show me that me as the operator, I can see when the process is drifting out of center. So as a result, I get a more consistent product. And I'll give you a couple examples right here. Here's one. Of course, a lot of people are familiar with the idea of marking gauges with a small piece of transparent tape. And what this tells people is that these are the ranges in which this machine should be operated. So when I adjust the valve, I make sure that the needles are within that range. And if I fall out of those range, I know that corrective action needs to take place before I have a stoppage. One other good uh, example is, is for those of you who, who may uh, operate stamping shops. We see a lot of dyes and a lot of tooling and it. This could be machining as well. This could be injection molding where we have the ability to move a piece of tooling around in a slotted hole and uh, we tend to move it around and tweak it and get back and forth and get out of line, cause scrap, cause problems on a piece of tool that could be simply located in one positive place. So in this case, in order to achieve center lining, what these companies did was they standardize the height of the tooling, so they're always going to be the same by putting these spacer blocks in and added a location block. So rather than trying to determine how far uh, horizontally to the in the X direction it needed to, to line up or Y direction it needed to line up, it went to one point and that's where it stayed. So now our process in that aspect and those two aspects are on center line. And we've removed one more potential cause of deviation, stoppage, uh, scrap, et cetera, et cetera. A third uh, example, of, a third key uh, uh, property of maintenance excellence uh, is one that is, to, to my way of thinking, is vastly overlooked at this point in time, and that is the concept of precision maintenance. Now, most of you folks out there have probably heard of preventative maintenance, and predictive maintenance, and some of you probably have even heard of proactive maintenance. And preventative and predictive are all about detecting problems that we know are going to happen. And just a little, um, just a little bit of a, a news flash for you: some of the experts in the maintenance industry will tell you that the planned domain is not stable. And what that means is, is that unless we are repairing things properly. We do preventative and predictive maintenance, always anticipating that a failure will happen at some point. Well, I ask the question, why do those failures need to happen in, at some point? And some of the responses that I get are, we don't have the right tools, we don't have the right processes, our employees are not trained, we don't get the right parts, uh, we don't really have good settings for things. And precision maintenance is the concept that what is good for a machine parameter, what, is, what qualifies as good, is measurable. For example, um, many of you probably have pieces of equipment in your facility that runs on a V-belt drive. 
Well, there are two measurable qualities uh, that are, are aspects of precision maintenance that have to be used. One is, is that the belts need to be aligned between the pulleys to a certain measurable distance. So plus or minus X number of thousands. The second one is, is that the pulley needs to be adjusted to a certain pound of tension, number of pounds of tension. So we can apply that to things like uh, electrical power quality, uh, how bearings fit on a shaft, how clean our oil needs to be. And when we have those measurable installation servicing and repair uh, procedures, what happens is we come very much uh, closer to the anticipated design life of those components, i.e. they don't fail before they're supposed to. So if they don't fail before they're supposed to, we're minimizing those unplanned failures, we're maximizing our life, and we have less disruption to the production process. How does that support process excellence? Well, what we have now is we have an operator who's operating a machine who is not at all concerned about an early failure because they are confident that the machine is gonna run because their maintenance department applies precision maintenance techniques and they can focus on the aspects that allow them to make good quality parts. Precision installation practices basically are, are things like laser alignment, uh, doing things measurably, and they basically, they're gonna get us the, the longest amount of life that we expect from our equipment. So if we think about that curve that we were looking back earlier where our machine operated a certain level of excellent performance for a certain amount of time before a potential failure started and then dropped off to the point where we had functional failure, what precision maintenance does is it extends the length of this straight part of the curve and allows us to get greater life or to get maximum life before we have uh, reach the end of our useful life and have the performance begin to deteriorate. So we detect that fault at this point and we say maybe we need to do some things like we need to adjust the tension on that belt or else it's going to fail or realign that shaft coupling. Probably one of the most significant ones that I think a lot of people are doing but I don't know utilizes to the maximum is analyzing our stoppages. Now there's a lot of names for this. I hear people talk about uptime analysis or failure reporting and corrective action systems. We're gonna go with OEE or overall equipment effectiveness. And we use, we use that data that we get from OEE to analyze where our problems are and to methodically eliminate those problems. Uh, OEE, uh, just so for those of you who may not have heard of it is, is what do I plan to make when I plan to make it? So how much of my available uptime am I devoting to making good product? The basics of the process go like this, is that we are going to, while we run, we're going to evaluate all the stoppages that we have, or not evaluate them, we're gonna record them, we're gonna classify them. Were we down for setup? Were we down because we were starting up and there was some product loss based on the, the first couple of pieces that come out are never right? Did we have to stop to clean the machine? Did we have a breakdown? Um, did we have to stop to measure or, or to get more supplies? So what we do is we take a look at those failures over a period of time and we identify where the big hitters are coming from. That's just not all. At this point, we need to engage our team to see what we can do to establish countermeasures or cures for those failures to eliminate the, the unplanned stoppages that are coming up. And I'll give you a, a small example right here. This is one that we talk about that we did with a lot of our clients years, with one of our clients years ago. It was a small machine and what it did was it processed a brass rod, it cut it, and it uh, did a stamping and machining and forming operation to both ends. And what happened was is the client was interested in understanding why they could not achieve the production rate, you know, good product, uh, correct rate over time. So our team that was evaluating this operation decided to go and to watch what was happening. And as we approached the machine, we found that the team that was running it was just coming off of a setup at the time. 
and they were beginning to run um, production runs. They're just trialing out their first few parts. And as they'd run one through um, for that first minute, they were stopping to adjust because the collar end of the rod was too small, so they had to adjust the tooling. Well, they ran a few of them. The next thing they know, they're out of rods, and somebody had to run across the shop and get it from the previous process, uh, take, taking down 15 minutes. They started running them through, and they adjusted the feed clamps. And they started running them again. They said, oh, somebody forgot the, the boxes. So we started to go make boxes, and we ran. And ran for three minutes, made a couple of uh, measurements, and said, we need one more adjustment, and then began running good parts. So when we took a look at what happened using, using this, uh, this process of OE analysis, we found out that for the 61-minute time, we only ran 18 minutes, and the losses were 43 minutes. And a lot of people, I, I picture a lot of people walking around uh, bragging about their OEE or complaining about their OEE, and what I'm really interested in is that total loss time and how I can get away with that. And, you know, when I took a look at this, I saw two things or our team saw two things that we said we definitely could improve here. And one of them was is that there's no reason why we should run out of rods or make boxes. When we do a setup, we should be ready for the run. So that involved uh, adding uh, a step to one of the utility positions, um, tasks and duties to make sure that the, the, uh, all the machines were checked within a certain amount of time to make sure they had boxes, product, et cetera, et cetera. The other point was, is there's a number of adjustments, adjusting for a small collar, adjusting clamps, adjusting due to a swage. Well, this process had a lot of adjustments and no settings. So what happened was, is this team said, we're going to do two things. We, we established those two processes and they just got rid of, when they just got rid of the first one, which was waiting for the, you know, the rods and the producing the good parts, I go from, you know, a 29% OEE to an 83% OEE. Now make no mistake, take, collecting the data is good, but, but the real process that makes it work behind there is having some sort of team, some sort of ongoing process to review our stoppages. So many people uh, who are devoted to process excellence get a ream of data and then don't really have a good idea what to do with it. So what we're going to say is that on a regular basis, we need to collect and analyze that data. If you look down at number two, you see that nice little Pareto analysis and, and not focus on all 10 of the items, but on the top three and then quickly migrate those top three into uh, some sort of meeting or, or group discussion where we can, you know, perform a root cause analysis, you know, using things like our, our fishbone diagram and five whys, uh, brainstorm our solutions and implement what we've come up with. And the big thing that we ask people to consider in this process is to try not to fall into analysis paralysis. Don't let perfect be the enemy of better. Let's work on getting it better. Improving our equipment and improving our maintenance practices is a stepwise operation. We do it step by step by step as we learn. We're not gonna make that first jump to perfect, but we do have to be persistent in looking at our problems and to gradually try and improve them. Now, the next process that we look at, or the sub-process for maintenance to help improve maintenance excellence, is to plan and schedule our maintenance. We all know that time is at a premium right now, and perhaps we're at a state where we have a lot of corrective action that we have to do on our equipment to get it to where we want it to be. Thus, wrench time, or the time we actually spend on actually correcting that equipment is really going to be at a premium. But what we find is in many cases, the typical maintenance department goes out to the job and then has to return to the shop for a forgotten tool or a forgotten part, or because the machine is not ready yet, or because we're not sure about how to perform the repair and we have to, to uh, liaise with uh, another key person. So we don't have a good job plan. We don't have all the parts we need. So maintenance planning and scheduling is effectively about coming up with optimal procedures for corrective maintenance. So I'm going to write up a job plan. I'm going to say these are the steps that we go through to execute this job. We're also going to pre-kit everything we need, our repair parts, our required tools, and our supplies. 
And that's a key point we have to look at as well. A lot of people kit the parts and kit, kit the tools and forget the supplies, the nuts, the bolts, the anti-seas, the little things, the shop rags. And what we tell people is, is it, it consumes just as much time, it wastes just as much time to go back to the shop for some small uh, supply that we think nothing of. The other thing that maintenance planning and scheduling does is it prioritizes that scheduled work by impact. We're not going to work on uh, a piece of, of, of equipment um, that only runs 60% of the time and has two other pieces of redundant equipment when we have failures on that one line that runs 24 seven. It also identifies uh, what we need as far as uh, time available and by doing planned maintenance as a result, since we, we do plan it and we get rid of the wastes, what we need for the time to be shut down to execute these repairs reduces. Of course, that gives us more time to operate consistently. And there's a couple of things to think about if you're really questioning um, the usefulness of planning and scheduling. Just a little, a little old graphic that we've had since, I don't know how, how, how long, but basically it looks as we would go across the screen at the time a maintenance craftsperson spends. They come in for their standard shift of eight hours and 10% of their time comes off due to breaks, lunch, safety meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And then we reduce it yet even more with administrative paperwork, training, slack time between jobs. And we're down to 60% of the eight, eight hours. By this point in time, we've got 4.8 hours available to actually work on preventative, predictive maintenance, and corrective maintenance. This is inspections and this is doing the actual work. Well, if I take a look at those two categories, I look at preventative maintenance and, oh geez, two thirds of the time I'm spending getting the material, traveling back and forth, setting up the job, putting it away, and about the same with our corrective maintenance. So what happens is at the very end, we're looking at of that eight hours, about 25% of our time is really what we would call wrench time when we're, we're executing the repairs. What can we do about this? Well, we did a little study on this at one point, and what we found out was this, is that in a department of seven maintenance technicians who were all about 25% utilized at 25% wrench time, that if we took one person out, we could effectively generate more wrench time. And this is how it went. Since we had, you know, seven techs at 25% utilization, we're getting two hours per day out of each of those techs of actual wrench time. So 14 hours of actual work completed during that time. So we pull one out and we're gonna make one a planner. We're gonna pull one out and everyone screams and says, oh my gosh, we're so be far behind now. How can you take away one of our people? Well, what happened was is we're gonna increase the labor utilization by better planning and scheduling. and in the first three months, all that planner did was making sure that, that their people had the parts and the tools and they jumped their utilization from 25 to 50%. I've tried it before myself at two other facilities and it works and usually I would say that's a pretty conservative number. So now we've got six people you know, that are 50% utilized, we're getting four hours per day out of each, six techs, now I've got 24 hours of wrench time you know, I'm getting as versus the old way, which was 14 per day. So I just, I saved right there. I saved 10 hours a day by taking one tech out of the, out of the, uh, the out of the process to become a planner. So that's another way we're going to improve our process excellence. What we're going to do is we're going to improve our wrench time so we can get more good corrective repair done faster. I suppose all of you, when you're thinking about process excellence, you're saying, why hasn't he mentioned total productive maintenance yet, or autonomous maintenance, as many people know it? Now, it's a pretty well-known fact, if you spend some time looking at things, that you have a lot of operators, you have a lot of inspectors, you have a lot of process techs that are on the floor that have a great deal of knowledge of how to make a process run well. And yet, we tend to look at maintenance as something that only the maintenance department takes care of. Yet, going back to our original premise of what we were thinking was we were saying that one of the reasons we don't really have uh, complete process excellence is because equipment's an obstacle. Well, what if I said we need to double 
the force of people who are caring about and caring for our equipment by improving a program of TPM, which is basically saying that since we know that the folks who operate the line have a lot of knowledge about it, why don't we engage them? So perhaps we have them involved in certain inspection and adjustment and basic maintenance tasks. Many of you uh, have worked at some point where lubrication tasks are performed by operators or filter changes are performed by them. So our maintenance team gets to spend more time on more complex, uh, more complex tasks. Additionally, what happens is, is our operators start having a, a little bit more of a feeling of ownership of their equipment. And when we, we put our operators and our maintenance people together, we've just doubled the problem solving power because we've got two people that care about it and now engaged in equipment care. And process improvement thrives. Now we've got everybody buying into not only, not only equipment care, but process care. And we think about what are some of the tools that are used. I could go on for hours about this because there's so many great TPM tools that could help move things along. But the basic one is, is to talk about using a daily operator inspection. That's a good one at the beginning of the shift to check and see what kind of condition the equipment is in. So we got a screenshot here that's of a, a visual that's posted on a machine at a chocolate company out in Chicago. Now what they do is they press the liquid chocolate, extract the cocoa butter, and get raw cocoa out of this. So when they come in, they check their alarms, they, they take a look around the equipment for broken rods and springs, um, they clean, they make sure the pressures are at, pressures are at the right operating, uh, right operating values, and if there's any problems, they report to maintenance where they get together and they say, why do we have a deviation on our steam pressure? What do we need to do? Why do I have broken springs? When can we take care of that? So we improve our engagement. And of course, if all of these things are in the right ranges, we're more likely to have a more consistently operating process. So those are some of the things that we talk about in uh, elements of, of maintenance excellence that we can do to support process excellence. And there are things that I think a lot of us are all doing to some degree, but if we, we, we seldom think about how it drives uh, more and better product getting out the door. So let's talk a little bit about what we've, what we've gone through here so far. First off, I want to caution some people about some barriers and obstacles to establishing uh, maintenance excellence. In too many companies, people say, we've got a maintenance department. Why do we need to improve? We don't see the need. We've been repairing this equipment for years and years and years. The one I get the biggest kick out of is, is people say we don't have the resources to improve, yet we have all the money for overtime. We have all the money to rework product. We have all the money to to a fast ship product that was late to the customer. We have money to spend with OSHA because somebody got hurt on a piece of, a piece of equipment. The one I think that we can address easier than anything else is the folks that say they don't know how. And, and like I like to tell people, unless you're building rockets, you, this is not rocket science. Adopting a process of maintenance excellence is a lot easier than you think. There's many things involved in it, but they're basically fundamentally simple things. The other thing is, is people say, I think it's a great idea to do it, but I don't know how to show payback. And I think we talked about a slide earlier on about, you know, what's the cost of a minute of downtime? And I, in my own professional life, have used that more than once, where I have gone to my general manager and said, if you can give me four hours to perform this corrective maintenance on this piece of equipment, I will get rid of 20 hours of downtime, and I have a fundamentally uh, a fundamental payback um, exercise there. Some people are unwilling to change. We're happy where the where we are, or shall we put it this way? There, there's a bit of fear associated with. I don't know if I'll be able to do it if we change. Another one, big big problem that we have both in continuous improvement and in maintenance excellence is we put a lot of processes in place, but nobody audits or follows up to make sure that they're being done correctly. But there are some things that we can do to help move this process along and to, to be able to achieve maintenance excellence. And I would say some of those things are, the first thing is, is 
your leaders have to believe it is important, have to believe that good maintenance is important. And when I say good maintenance, I mean not breakdown maintenance, preventative maintenance, proactive maintenance, planning and scheduling, autonomous maintenance and TPM, precision maintenance, all these items, they have to fundamentally believe that they are the right thing to do to keep equipment running constantly as, as to meet the end of the process running excellently. We need to have clear expectations about what we're going to do, about how we're going to get there, that it's not an overnight thing, but it is going to take everyone's involvement, that it will be difficult. We need to have well-defined roles and responsibilities who are going to put these processes into place, who's going to train people on them, who's going to take the time to follow up and to help make sure that they're being done correctly. You need a plan. We can't just say we're going to do all this tomorrow. We have to do it in stages. We have to take time to let that plan develop and to, to work it out excellently. We need metrics to, to track the progress as well. What sort of things am I going to check? Well, uptime, OEE are great ones. Are my PMs getting done, PM completion? Percentage of work that's reactive is versus proactive. I want to see a lot more proactive than reactive work, planned versus reactive. Mean time between failures. There's a number of things like that that we can take a look at. We need to have a willingness to change, and a lot of people are very change averse. Our life, our life changes. In uh, the typical manufacturing operation that is running in a breakdown mode, probably the people that are valued the most are the folks that are the firefighters, the heroes. Your heroes no longer are going to be important because you're not you're not in the point where you want to be firefighting. You want the people catching problems ahead of time. People have to find that a valuable thing and be willing, willing to change. In order to accomplish this, you also have to have lots of follow-up and understand what works and what doesn't work and be able to adapt rapidly. You need to be able to, to be persistent in the face of struggle. This will seem like a tremendous monumental task, but to look for those little victories and to celebrate them and to get your people behind them and say, this is a good thing and maintain positivity. If you can get those elements together, you're probably going to be on track to developing a process of maintenance excellence. So what do you get from all this in the end? As maintenance begins to improve, what am I going to get? I got all these things. What's going to happen? The mean time between failures on my equipment. Hey, it's going to get longer between breakdowns. and It's going to take less time to repair them. The average cost of repairs are going to go down and my hazards, my injuries are going to drop as well. I'd like to believe my overtime and my emergency purchases, emergency shipments and air freight are gonna drop, as well as my scrap. Here's a good one, if I take care of my equipment, I won't have to retire it as early. That machine that I bought may last that full 20 years and not that 12 years. Deliveries are gonna get better. Equipment availability, available time to produce is going to increase and it's going to be more repeatable. The quality coming out is going to be much, much more consistent. And what all that's going to do is going to give us a greater amount of opportunities for us to spend on improving the process rather than simply bringing it back from the dead. So what does it look like? What else does it look like? If I look at performance of my equipment, reliability, there's a good one. Under a standard breakdown maintenance program, this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to start out when I've fire up that machine. I'm never going to make 100% of what I, what I thought I was going to get. And gradually, my performance is going to deteriorate. I'm going to get way down and somebody's going to say, you have to fix that machine now and nothing more than a simple overhaul is going to be done. And we're going to start dropping off again to the point where we get down around 20% and say, you need, it's time to get rid of that machine. On the other hand, if we decide that we're going to pursue a program of maintenance excellence, the curve is going to look like this. We're going to say that the, the day the, the, the machine performed the worst was the first day we got in the shop and we're just going to improve it. And we're going to maintain a constant level of excellent, excellent performance until we begin to go into the wear out phase. What's the difference? Well, I'm sure everyone understands the visual cue of a large block of green and first off, it represents the fact that we, during this period, we've been able to produce a much larger uh, amount of 
quality product and do it safely as well. And of course, we had a lot more capacity. Not only had a lot more capacity, but we were probably able to forecast our customer needs and to give them a lot more reassurance they'd get their pro product on time. So we could actually make more and we could recoup that, you know, we could actually realize that larger amount of margin by having being able to produce more parts. So overall, it's a difference in profits and sales. So that's really what we're talking about when we, we think about process excellence. That's what we can achieve. Think about, I want you to think about that. Are any of those elements things that are all too difficult for you to put into place? Most companies won't, won't find that they're too difficult to do as long as we start thinking about it early and getting together a good plan. So effectively, those are the things that we want to pursue. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. And what will it give us? Well, we all know that when we're running well, we have a lot more time to make better product and to improve our processes. So my advice to you is to take a look at your processes, your maintenance processes today, to assess your, your processes and identify where we can apply some of these tools and techniques that we talked about this morning and begin as soon as possible and reap the results that we can come that we can get from that. So that's really it. That's the end of our presentation. And I'd be eager to answer any questions that you might have uh, right now to talk about uh, uh, more details that we'd like to, to know as far as um, maintenance excellence. Um, if anyone has one, you can use the chat or feel free to unmute yourself um, to ask the questions. But we don't have any at this current time. Hi, Larry. This is this is Dave Hannon uh, with Mantech. Um, I was I was interested to to learn a little bit more about you know, talk about a uh, the cost of a minute of downtime. And I was wondering if you could go through that process to help develop the ROI for the customer as to the importance of, of making the changes, um, the, the, the elements of, of uh, calculating that cost of the minute and um, how you would progress through the ROI. That would, be, that would be really excellent. Typically what we do is this, we keep it a lot simpler than a lot of people understand because what we're trying to show is incremental improvement. And the way I did it, uh, in some of my past lives was I would go to my controller and say for fiscal year 2021 what is our sales plan and they would give me a basic understanding of what I could get across the whole facility or on this line or that line or that line and then I would say what are our scheduled operating hours for next year so what I could do is I could derive uh, amount of sales assuming fully loaded for that line or that facility per hour. So now I have, this is what I generate per hour. Then I came back around to my uh, controller and said, well, what is our anticipated profit? And they'd say, well, that's hard to, hard to uh, draw a beat on. They would say, well, we, we anticipate making a 7% profit across all product lines. Now it wasn't perfect and it wasn't 100% uh, accurate, but what it did was is we were able to take that back to our operating floor and to give those people those numbers, say, you know, a, a minute of downtime is worth $220 and we lose, you know, $14, $14 worth of profit for each one of those minutes there. And now all of a sudden they have something they can wrap their hands around. They understand what the money is. And they say, well, you know what? Well, if we're going to lose $220 worth of sales for every minute, then taking, you know, doing this repair that, that uh, will, will take us six hours, uh, will, will result in losing that six hours times 220 times 60, but in the end will reduce this 12 hours of downtime that we had when we didn't do that repair. So basically that is the, the very simple and, and, and um, rough cut justification that we, we used. Does that help you understand a little bit better the way we're, we're, um, doing that justification? Absolutely, thank you. And it's an easy one. What we get is we get a lot of people saying, well, we can't get it perfect. We can't get you exact numbers. Well, the concept is not to get exact numbers, but to get, get your, uh, your teams making informed decisions based on 
uh, profit and loss and, and looking and saying, if we invest this time for this care, does it get us back more time? Got you. Thank you. I You're think welcome. we have one connected to this. Can you speak to data management and analytical tools to help make better maintenance decisions? At what stage do you recommend investing in software tools? Well, very early on uh, in software tools in maintenance. Now, pretty much today, I would expect that any, um, any, main, any organization is going to have a computerized maintenance management system. The functionality of what's available today is tremendous. Um, pretty much any software that you're going to, you're going to select is going to have uh, a, a great deal of ability to um, analyze data in there but you get out what you put in. Setup is important. I have seen many, many companies purchase expensive computerized maintenance management systems that had the capability to analyze uh, decisions based on failure types, failure equipment, and simply did not put in good data into the system. And as a result, we're not able to use that analytical capability. So we have a suite of tools out there. We have, we have, um, trying to think of what it is. We have manufacturing execution software systems that harvest data from machines. I don't think the problem so much is the software and the software is essential. The real important thing is, is that we have the discipline to uh, classify and quantify the stoppage data as something other than other or miscellaneous, et cetera, et cetera. You get what you put in. I have a few on my personal chat here. If our maintenance people are so swamped responding to breakdowns now, how can we find the time to get started on becoming proactive? <clears throat> Here's the deal. I'm going to be simple and no one's going to like this. I know the general managers aren't going to like the answer. You got one of two things you got to do. You got to let some fires burn or you got to add resources. That's the answer. There is no, there is no way to bend physical reality and to get more, more blood out of that stone. You know, I, like I tell a lot of people, it's a difficult road. Here's the thing, and, and this is, this is my, my caveat for those folks that are, are really tearing their hair out on this. One is, is that if you decide to let some fires burn, or if you decide to add more resources, before you do it, make sure you have a good plan. Make sure that if you're going to adopt one of those, adopt one of those um, alternatives, that you have a good plan to maximize it. For example, if I'm going to bring in more people to solve a problem, don't just bring them in to do more firefighting. Let's talk about how we can allocate some people to really do good proactive maintenance first. Let's make one a planner. Or if we have to let some fires burn, let's make sure everyone understands what fires are not going to burn and what we're going to do, what we're going to do to bring them back from the dead rather than just keep them on on life support, we want to, want to bring them back to full health. That's a great question, by the way. I, everyone asks me that every time. I got a bunch yeah, of that right there. It's um, I just got done dealing with a situation like that. It's um, currently where I'm at is like two maintenance guys here, and um, one of them the way it is is like the response that I got to something like that was like pretty much they let like the machine operators put their hands on stuff that I don't feel comfortable that is safe for them. So I kind of kind of explained to them as to why and what, what it can cause and how they might temporarily fix a problem, but if they keep on doing it, it'll just lead to more longer downtime, which costs the you know company more money down down the road because because of a breakdown. Because a lot of our parts come from overseas and there's like weeks of a lead time for the actual part to get here. So the response I pretty much got with that one was, you know, they pretty much had to do what they had to do in order to keep things running. So sometimes, like, it, it seems like no matter where you work at, maintenance and production always bump heads. Maintenance is more about safety and keeping things going and, you know, production flowing, whereas production, like, supervisors, they tend to, like, care about numbers and don't really care about the uh, actual machinery. So how can pretty much, like, it's kind of hard to let them understand where we come from. Sometimes we just got to put our hand up and say, hey, you know, it is what it is and that's all we can do. And then once it does happen, what we warned them about, we want to say, I told you, but we can't because next thing you know, you get in trouble. So we just let it go. <laughs> so I think, I think one of the things we got to do is we got to 
got to step back and realize, in a way, we're kind of all serving the same goal, right? We all want a paycheck. We all yeah, want to keep yeah. going. None of us want to lose a finger, but we've got different ways of getting to it. And one of the things that, that, that does help to succeed is if, if I'm the leader in that company, I'm going to try to come up with some sort of vision, come up with some sort of message that addresses all those items and say, this is your part and this is your part and this is what we have to do together. What you were describing in there sounds like we got people that were uh, pursuing a short-term goal. If we just go a little further, we just get a little more out of this, it'll be okay. People want to want to push a little more without maintenance, a little more without maintenance. It's like you're rolling that dice. Well, you know, here's the deal. Maybe you can roll a dice and, and you can get you can get sevens and elevens for you know for year after year after year. But one of them days you're gonna roll, roll snake eyes and you're gonna be really sorry you did. Here's the thing, there's only so long your luck holds out on that. And I think it takes some real some real difficult conversations. And as far as getting operators involved, I'll tell you one thing. You've got operators that are willing to do something with the machine, even if it's the wrong thing, you know, feel good about that. You've got somebody who's engaged in the process in some way. And what ways can we train them to avoid the problems? Maybe we go out and we say to them, you know, all these little tweaks you're making, what do you think we got to do to keep us from having to do these tweaks that are going to make it worse and worse and worse? Or those guys that, you know, want to, want to, uh, you know, whip the machine to get a little further. Well, if they can work, if they can whip it to go further, they're also guys that can perform basic maintenance tasks as well. Yeah. So you've got, you, you kind of got a, you know, a situation where there's some possibilities there. But remember that bit about leadership. It's got to start at the top and that person, that, that, that guy at the top, that person at the top has got to, got to say, look, we're not going for short-term gain. We're going for long-term gain. If the equipment stays consistent, our production will stay consistent. We all have to do things to, to maintain that consistency. Cool. We have a few other questions. If we can only afford to take a machine offline for four hours a week, is it still possible to transform that cell one byte at a time or do we need to take it down for a couple of days? Well, sometimes the answer is yes and yes, really. I guess I'd have to know a little bit more about the machine, but I've seen people do it incrementally with the four hour shots once a week or, or two days, you know, once a week, I'd have to know more about it, but there's always something you can do. And that kind of talks to the aspect of maintenance planning and scheduling. I would ask that client, what is the worst failure that you're, that you're experiencing on it? And if we figured out what the worst problem was, how long would it take to rectify that? Perhaps that first four hour slot might be simply performing an inspection to identify all the problems that we have. Classifying things between items that could be done while we're running and items we have to do while we're down. Perhaps it will come to a point where we identify one failure that will take a full two days. But I don't think we can go in and say, figure out the time. I don't think you can go in and, and, and make a time requirement before you understand what the problems are and how much how they need to be addressed. So figure out what the problems are, rank them in, in, in priority, and then determine how much time they need. Um, what final one that I see on chat, do you, have, ha, do you ever help companies to set up TPM programs, especially if maintenance techs are still learning? Absolutely. That's <laughs> what we do a ton of time. I cannot, I, I've probably done, in the last 10 years, probably done a couple hundred uh, TPM programs, focused events. And what we found is it doesn't just help the maintenance techs, but it helps operators. It ha helps um, set up people, uh, quality people, uh, environmental health and safety people. Um, the big thing is that we get out of TPM is, is uh, it's, like, it's like the phrase you hear, rising tide lift all lifts all boats. It elevates our ability to maintenance equip to maintain equipment, but also elevates our ability to produce and make better parts, be safer, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, we do it a huge amount of TPM. And Mantech would be proud to connect you to um, assist you if that is a, a need that you have. I, I'd love, I, I'll tell you what, I love, uh, love dealing with new clients and seeing new processes, new technologies. It's probably the single most rewarding thing for me is to work with a, a company like we have with our, our friends at Mantech that we've, we've done already, you know, at many places. Sure. Were there any other questions out there? 
All right. Well, thank you for your time. We do have um, more webinars being planned. Um, I know we have our maintenance friends here. You probably may not care about pricing in a crisis, but um, someone at your company may. So that's coming up July 9th. We will send a follow-up email that will include the um, recording of this so that you can look back at that. And we are also asking participants to help us out um, on a survey that we are conducting on how you've been affected through COVID-19. So we would appreciate your um, few minutes to fill that out as well. Um, but otherwise, thank you and have a great day. Thank you very thank much. You.